this is all part of a committee uh, that we're calling our facilities steering committee. We're having uh, discussions with some community members who are on the committee and our administrators who are kind of trying to um, get into this idea of what is it that is of the most dire need. Uh, so John will talk about that part of it. And what my part of it is to talk about is why right now this is really so especially important. The timing of this is really critical and there may feel like, wow, this is a weird time of year maybe to have these meetings, but it really is very important. We're doing this all now. And the reason why I say that is because uh, we have for the last three years been beneficiaries of a new state funding formula for education. Uh, and the way this is different is in the past, money given to every school from the state was based on their local uh, property value, uh, those assessments, your EAV we call it, uh, and that was basically how it was calculated in your average daily attendance and that's kind of how you knew as a district how much money you'd receive. Well, the formula is a lot more complex now and it benefits us a great deal because it's calculated on this idea of what's the adequacy of the amount of money coming to you from the state. So they determine you know, what type of students are in the school. Um, do they have English language learners, special ed students? Those things make a higher value. And it also appreciates that uh, communities that have a lower EAV or taxable value that can be con contributions to the district's wealth, uh, that makes a big difference. We wanna make sure that we've got enough funding for that. So when the very first version of this, they determine every school district in Illinois' adequacy percentage. So in our very first go-round with that, we were at only 50% adequacy. We are actually the third lowest school district in the whole state in terms of adequacy. So while that's not great news because it means we're horribly underfunded, the state should be giving us approximately twice as much money as it was, um, we knew that there was some funding that accompanies that. So what the legislator has done for the last three years, they've supported this. So if you talk to legislators, tell them to continue to support evidence-based funding because it's making a huge difference for us. The first year we got an additional $2.2 .2 million from the state beyond what the initial allocation was. Um, in the second year, they added another 1.8 to that initial 2.2. So every year they kind of stack more. And this year, I think it was 1.4 million. Um, it was in that range before it settled. So we are the recipients and we are trying now to figure out how to uh, properly address the needs of the district. What we've done so far with that money is really address instructional needs. We have a lot of instructional needs. Um, for the first time ever, we have, uh, as you might have heard if you follow closely along, we have art classes last year. We started that program at Crosby and Jefferson. That was something we didn't really have in the past. We this year have instructional coaches. We've done things with technology. We've done things to address class size problems. So there's a lot of things that evidence-based money has allowed us to do that frankly we could just never do before because our money was way, way too tight. But we still have obviously needs and now it, since we're at a stable spot with addressing like the educational personnel, like we've added social workers, we've added counselors, uh, we've done a lot of things to help the social emotional needs of our kids. But now it's time to look at our facilities and so when you combine that, how is this money that will be coming to us if the legislator continues to support this, how do we use that money? But secondarily, the last um, legislature that met, they also <coughs> approved a $1.5 billion school construction project. So that money, it's yet been determined the exact process, but last week I was at a, or actually it was two weeks ago now, I was at a um, kind of a um, administrative meeting and they invited legislators to come talk about hot topics. And one of the things that in that 1.5 million, I just asked them, I said, how are you gonna prioritize the school districts? We're a tier one school district. And they said, absolutely, that the first schools to be able to speak up for that 1.5 billion uh, would be tier one schools like us. So we feel like we're in a really good spot right now to be addressing some of these fundamental questions of how are we gonna operate. We have to address these issues and so we can do it with some of that additional state money that's coming and we're gonna put our name in because March 1st is kind of the deadline we're hearing that they're gonna release how school districts apply for whatever percentage of that 1.5 billion. Now, obviously we're not gonna get all of that, uh, but <laughs> what can we put our name in? But they're gonna consider districts like ours, tier one districts, and they're gonna ask us to have something that there's a local contribution, so we're kind of planning that out. And then also, um, are you, do you have a, sh they call them shovel ready projects. So that's why we're working with John, so that we have these projects ready to go. And so when those come out, we say, we would like X amount of dollars for these projects. So we're trying to be very, very prepared for when that moment strikes, we're ready to say, this is what um, the project is. So the idea of this um, steering committee, if you will, and the meetings like these 
is to kind of design what would our plan be? What's our biggest need? How can we take care of the biggest problems that we have in the district in all five of our facilities? So what will happen is um, at the December board meeting, and you're certainly welcome, I mean, it's a public meeting, we encourage you to come, but come and listen to the ideas that John and his colleague Allison are working on to present to the board. Like, these are our recommendations. These are the things we think that would make the most impact immediately for the students of the district based on the things that principals are saying these are things that are priorities for us these are things we can't do so that will allow the board to kind of have maybe a funnel down list of priorities and that's how then we have to figure out the financing of these whole things too because we want to be ready certainly for that march 1st deadline for all the application so that's kind of the why this is all coming together this time. So there's some really exciting opportunities for our district. And as you can see, not only from this walkthrough, but if you've been on other walkthroughs, all of our buildings have things and we're going to tackle those things. We're not gonna pretend like they don't exist. We wanna meet the needs of our students and we have to do that with fine facilities. And so those are some things going on. I'm gonna introduce John and I want him to talk a little bit about what he calls uh, educational or instructional adequacy. <laughs> I always say it wrong, don't I, John? Mm -hmm. uh, educational adequacy, because what he does is look at the needs of the buildings, and every building gets a percentage of how they meet the educational adequacy of what that building's trying to do. And I'll let you talk about the different numbers of the different schools, John, because you explain that a lot better than I do. Great. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Foya. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to see you, you come out. Um, as Dr. Foya said, we have been studying uh, each of the district facilities mm -hmm. and trying to establish a measurable benchmark for each building uh, in terms of how well it's serving the needs of the students and their instruction in that building. Uh, it is measurable. Um, everything is measured against standards uh, that are known um, by evidence to produce the kinds of results that we all want to see. So each building kind of has an adequacy target, just like the evidence-based funding. Um, typically the older buildings like Harvard High School is right now at about 50% uh, of a full, fully adequate. Uh, Crosby being the newest building is just under 90%. Um, so age certainly has a factor on that, uh, particularly in, as you've seen maybe tonight, rooms tend to be a lot smaller here. Uh, it's one of the problems that even creates capacity issues here at Harvard High School because they are scheduled, as Mr. Hollingsworth said, right to the absolute max in every <coughs> classroom, which doesn't really allow any space for more students for new programming. Uh, and uh, the new programming in particular is essential to keeping up with 21st century learning. So it's both the style of learning and the learning contact, content and the ways in which that learning can be delivered in a more collaborative fashion. Um, so what I really wanna say though is the process and the reason for these community meetings uh, is to involve the community in that collaboration. Uh, it's your buildings, it's your district, it's your students, uh, and they're the future of Harvard. So it's really essential that we hear from you. So I'd like to just ask a few questions and try to get you involved a little bit. Yeah. I, uh, one other thing that I want to mention that's also a contributing factor to this is that we as a school district are growing. We have more students this year than we did last year, and we've grown at about 80 students in the last three years. So we are moving and, and growing, and that only makes the space issues that you see even more tr tricky for John and Carl and his staff to kind of figure out how do we fit. On the tables there, if you care to look, is what uh, the board did is it's called a Casarda demographic site that shows the expected growth. Also is some work that John did as preliminary on the status of the building. Like, what is the infrastructure needs and things like that. So I want to mention that those are also part of why this just does feel like a little pressure to really address these issues. And so those are also on the website that I would just mention that if you're curious and don't want to look through tonight, they're there for you. And that's probably be the same place where this video will be and a place for any community member to submit any questions or comments they have. I don't know the answer exactly to that, Rebecca, but I think that's just the way it's been forever, and it's gone unquestioned, and that's exactly why we're inviting people in 
to look at this because it's time to ask those questions. Why is it like that? And what should we be doing to do that? And is there a viable solution that's you know possible? Um, those this, this is the time to ask those questions. You're right. Yeah. So and it's troubling. It's it really, very troubling. It really yeah, is. Yeah. Absolutely. Those are examples of things that are inadequate that contribute <clears throat> to that adequacy score. Uh, and it's not just the physical condition and the size, uh, it's location too. So if any of you are here for athletic events, you know that there's games in both gyms. Well, during the day, students are doing this constantly back and forth, locker room to gym, locker room to gym, back and forth, walking down the halls basically. Um, so both for athletics where essentially the entire building becomes open to everyone who's here. Uh, and during the day, when you basically have students who may even be cutting through the lunchroom uh, to get from a locker room to the gym. And, and you can just keep going down the list. Where do officials change? And do they have a changing space that's all their own before our games? No. Um, where do our coaches change? But when they come, where do our female coaches have a ladies locker room? We don't have that for them to even change. So it's, it's just, if you keep going down that rabbit hole, it's really upsetting. And we, you know, I've had people on that same tour come out literally in tears. And so that's why we have invited you in here. So, because I can tell you it's bad, but then when you see it, you're going to tell people. And that really is what we hope motivates our community to understand. We're not crying wolf here. We're not saying that we're trying to fleece people for money. These are dire needs that we have to address. And it is upsetting, and it should be. I mean, that's why when I walked, I was like, oh, we got to start talking about this. And, you know, to the board, like, let's build a plan so we can address this. We have to. There's no choice. Great question. Um, the, there's a couple of things, and remember that we're tying this to programming. So Dr. Tafoya had mentioned, or maybe it was John, I don't remember, uh, that art was added into the curriculum uh, two years ago. So art didn't exist when Crosby was built, so there were no art rooms. Uh, if you're familiar with the building, there are four collaboration areas, one in each grade level center. Uh, those were what's called a STEAM space, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So the classroom teachers were delivering art in that space. So they would just move from their classroom to there. Well, now two of those four have been taken over as art <coughs> rooms full time. Uh, at the same time, the growth in special education programming has added more and more intervention staff into the building. And so remember, sorry to interrupt you, but CEDEM, uh, we pull right. all of our students back from CEDEM, right. so right. that took, you know, six classes yeah. um, right. there. So. And that, and that, I wasn't thinking about CEDEM. When we yeah. right. that's so th those folks are now staff members, uh, and even though Crosby was designed with lots of large group and small group space, all of those small group spaces have now been taken over and are no longer available for student collaboration. and. Now they've started to spill, and about half of the other two um, discovery centers, those group areas, they're now broken up for intervention. So they're doing pullout and bringing students into those areas. So those classroom teachers have lost the use of that uh, group space that was shared between nine to 10 classrooms in each of the grade level groupings. It's uh, the biggest building in the district, too, in terms of enrollment. There's 800 kids there, over 800 kids there. And so, like Jason's cl classroom, his big gym, you think, oh, it's a big gym. Well, really, we should probably have three sections of PE that we run a lot of time. But, you know, they'll put the thing down, they'll run two sections out of there, but they're full and they're big and it's challenging. Yeah. And at the same time, they're this close to the capacity of the building. Uh, and um, even though it has good sized classrooms, because of the district's commitment to a dual language model uh, and with the parents able to choose whether they are in a monolingual program or a dual lingual programming, uh, the demand for the dual lingual classes is larger. And at least right now at the second grade level, that has resulted in much larger class sizes in the dual language uh, classes. So those classrooms are stretched. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happens is the more students you get in the classroom, the less flexibility you have
to be able to rearrange tables like you saw at the uh, business incubator. Um, so, so that's what that 10% really is, that combination of those And, and let me those finish things. with the rest of the adequacy percentage <laughs> before you think I completed that. Um, Washington, which is our pre-K building, is actually our lowest adequacy percentage of any of the buildings, 46%. Um, and that's primarily the age of the building and the size. Um, we, we are limited just on the number of classrooms, and the classrooms really need a lot of renovation. Crosby is 90%, Jefferson, uh, right uh, across the way, also 50%, very, very tight building and older. Junior high is 64%, and here in the high school, 50% adequacy. So those are the numbers that we really have to get to, how do we gonna really meet the needs of our kids and the space and teachers providing them adequate learning spaces for their classes. Possibly that we haven't studied those kinds of things yet. That's not cheap. No, that's right, because if you're adding space, you're right, you gotta find a way to. Yeah, yeah so the chiller, for example, don't know how close that is to max at this point. And until we quantify whether an addition is needed, and how large that addition would be, really can't study that. But like water pumps at the junior high just had to be replaced. Some of these are at this age where you're getting you know, a significant amount of years on a lot of these things. And that's not insignificant cost itself. They haven't decided it yet, but there is a, a mention from PMA or our financial people that give us advice that there is expected to be some ask of the district to to at least have a contribution. I don't know if it'll be a okay. straight match, but we'll have historically there has always been a match. The little rumblings I've heard are that the larger the gap in your funding adequacy, the lower your yeah. local share. Right. So we are still the, the lowest adequacy percentage of any unit district in the whole state. So that's why when I asked and I made each legislator say, do you agree the tier ones should be funded first? They all nodded to me. So there were five votes. But that's why this is a really unique time because we're going to be able to make a really healthy ask into that amount of money. We don't know how much will be given in year one, but we should be one of the first ones since we'll have ready projects and we're a tier one district. nine years the crosby bond was a 20-year bond and we're 11 years into that and that's the next one that we have in this district everything else is mm -hmm. good question i think there's room to, room to do that everywhere wouldn't you say sean it's hard, hard, hard to ask sean's uh, been here three weeks i think yeah. so it may be hard for him to totally answer but that question that, but, but most of the buildings sorry. primarily are t8s right now but isn't that um, reimbursed through ComEd um, if the proper... There program, are some some incentives. There are some rebate programs. Yeah. So basically, the school district wouldn't cough up any money. Well, no, it's it's not quite you that. You would hire there, a there are, the contractor would deal with Yeah, there, there are rebates. It's not, wouldn't cover 100%. Good idea to look Those at programs it. have all changed recently because as of last year, ComEd took over all of those. So they're no longer under the state's direct control. Like I think of Jefferson, like there's no room over there, yeah. you know? I mean, I guess there's a little bit, but it, not a lot. But it is space challenge. The sites are space challenge. Yeah, the, most of them are that way. I mean, we, like this building, we are locked into this little space unless you build north towards the, the football field, perhaps maybe that gives you a little bit of space. So that's why we are here because there's no like idea, preconceived notion of what we want to do, whether it's a new school or add-ons or close a building or open new ones. I mean, that's, we're really open to whatever ideas are, are best in Boston. And we're going to continue to ask for probably some time until we've got a lot of good feedback because we don't know. I mean, when you look at some of these percentages though, the question becomes, is a renovation of a 43% adequacy school that doesn't have any space a good use of taxpayer money or not? Uh, that That's what we have to examine. Is that really what, or is it better just to build something that could be new and actually be designed from the start with the space that's needed? And, and which things are changeable? I mean, for example, if you have a double loaded corridor with classrooms on each side and those classrooms are 700 square feet and you're saying that the adequacy target is a 900 square foot room, 
to start taking all those walls out and try to make each classroom incrementally bigger is probably not really a viable mm -hmm. strategy. So it takes a little more creativity than, mm -hmm. than just something like that. In my mind, I mean, we've, years ago, we tried to get a new high school. In my mind, the, the question then is, if we were to somehow get a new high school, could we move the junior high here with that number of students and would that work and move the Jefferson kids up to the junior high and maybe just shut down that building? Would, would those numbers also work? So unsurprisingly, that idea had been floated just in conversation. Uh, and then someone else quickly pointed out, well, wouldn't all the same problems that are at the high school now just still exist and be transferred to the junior high? Well, no, I understand and, that. And, That's and why I'm asking about the numbers of kids at the junior high yeah. versus the high school. Yeah, they would, you'd still have to do some... Numerically, it certainly and, works because you'd be going from four grades to three. But The only challenge with that um, site up there is it's about 40 acres, and the research says now to build a high school that will last another 100 years, let's hope, is you need about 80 acres and it's only about 40, so it's about half the space we actually have. I, I know that the argument so, years ago was a lot of uh, grade work had to be done in order to There would be a lot of make it, it right. It is very rolling, rolling, yes. Um, the other complication that I think it's fair to mention is we think about, you know, growth in this community. The other thing that is kind of the people, and don't like to talk about this, but it's kind of a, a true fact, is there's a lot of conversation about what if happened if we really hit a growth spurt, what if Motorola really would happen. And that's that's an actual thing that's being bandied about again, and that's something that we you know it's hard to prepare for. We don't know what might happen, but that's another thing that we just have to kind of keep in mind. And so, 40 acres, maybe that's a new, you know, two, three building, or a, maybe a pre-K one building. We don't know any of these answers yet, but you could build something on that space. It's or, or trade the land for someplace else. That's right. Yeah. So that's that's the question. I'm aware. Yeah. Well, question with that. So 80 acres, though, is that considering probably football facilities and everything else? But if you were close enough, you could utilize the existing facilities maybe and cut back on some of that. Acre. I mean, up there for the yes. 40? Yeah. You'd have to cut out a lot of things and they would be the outdoor facilities mm -hmm. primarily. I mean, because you're over, I don't know how at the space is the mm -hmm. The layout of yeah. an of a camp campus and how big you know, we'd have to decide what's the anticipated enrollment going to be. How big do you build it for? Twelve hundred. We have um, the fourteen hundred, nine hundred. How big do you want to build that? Because then that would affect you know how much space you have. But you're right. The other thing that happens in some places now is they do astroturf fields because you, then you don't have to worry about the grass and you can have multiple people on the field and not have to do that. And so there's lots of issues with that. To, but space is a uh, real question on the high school. Yeah. One of the primary large consumers of space on a high school campus is parking. Um, this, you talk about adequacy, they have less than half of the proper number of spaces here. So you you, you limit drivers here, right? Yeah. And because you, there's no place for them to park, so. Yeah. Because you have room behind the junior high, you might have to move the soccer field somewhere. But I mean, ex expand the junior high, give that another grade level, or maybe even another two. I know Washington's a problem. Washington's well, a huge a, problem because a lot really, of that, that building's obsolete and it can't really do anything with it. You can't really add to it. And why wouldn't you add to a building with forty percent? A lot of districts have also done freshman campuses too, for our freshman sophomore campus. Um, so the configurations, there's not a philosophical approach of the district like we don't believe that, you know, we should have a range bigger than four grades because we do have that at Crosby. But some places <coughs> they adopt a philosophical approach that so we just think the age difference of between kids is so great that that's kind of an issue to talk about. We don't have that necessarily per se in the district yet, but those are the exactly the type of things that philosophically I think we need to figure out what we believe in so we can make good decisions to do that. And then it has to be viable in terms of space and for the, the growth we expect to see. Is it a possibility, like, if we do end up building a new Washington school, like, 
Berta Deer's in and Woodstock, how they have pre-K and kinder mm -hmm. in the same building. So it frees up some space in Crosby. Some uh, people have suggested to me that uh, to move the pre-K and kindergarten to Jefferson would be kind of size-wise that might, that might work actually. And then that would make Crosby a one, two, three building, which is the three of you who live there every day know would be would be beneficial. I mean that that could make it look feel a little better. Right? So a lot of ideas. I mean that's why we're here is float them. Let's uh, let one more keep question. Thinking. It yeah. just was kind of brought up when you mentioned Motorola. Um, what would happen if say something like that did happen and we have not been able to expand our schools yet and now we're at capacity. I mean because at a point we cannot take any more students. Right. Well, the first thing that would be affected is class size. Because as you know at Crosby, yeah. we would just have, and that's one of the things that evidence-based funding has done is provide us money so we could lower class size. Right. We've intentionally tried to really lower the class size because that's if one of the things more, they're giving us money. Then. So guess what happens to class size if we right. don't address this? They're just going to go right back up. And as you know, that's, that isn't what we're trying to do educationally first. But are we allowed to only have a certain amount of students in the building? Mm -hmm. Or can we just... No, I was, Keep going. The, I was the principal of a, uh, a school that was capacity 1800 and we had 2022. Okay, so, so we can just keep taking kids. And, it's, and it's miserable. Okay. I mean, it's, it's miserable. All right. um, yeah, and those things like art and music go away and go back to being on a cart. Yeah. Now, we did add subdivisions, but right. there hasn't been significant housing. Sure. We built in this town like two houses in the past six, seven years. So. Well, I mean, I, the other thing know. that it would do, though, is that added tax benefit yeah, that, would that really is diminish the the role of what a local taxpayer, a homeowner, would have to pay because their added contribution to what we need for our levy to meet our what we need educationally would really be affected. So that I mean, that would be a huge impact on a local uh, property owner for sure. Well, and, and to talk about what Jay was saying, part of the reason people weren't moving here was because of the school system. No, so you got a vicious circle. Exactly right. Well, and that's why these conversations are so important because we I think we need to demonstrate we have an educational plan to move our curriculum forward and to be prepared academically. And you're starting to see some of that. You know, the evidence of Jefferson moving um, a step higher was something that really is a sign of I think what will become. But we also need to answer the facility questions. You know, you're not going to send kids to a place that where it just it doesn't feel like it's modern. I mean, that's what we have to really tackle. You're absolutely right. Realtors tell us that all the time. What are you guys doing? Uh, we got to get it figured out. Alden Hebron asked if we wanted to consolidate. Um, they did a study. They're kind of they've kind of pulled that offer back a little bit. Um, but the thing with Alden Hebron is they're not going to bring us, I guess, a lot of student population that will help us you know, raise the district, but we also would have to take on their facilities and their facilities are frankly in worse shape than ours. So we would, we would take on their high school, which really they feel like they either need to make a decision to do a referendum or to tear it down and, and do something completely different. They've asked Woodstock, Harvard, and Richmond Burton to look at a consolidation. So which, those, we're just incomplete right now because we're kind of waiting to see what we locally decide to do first. Because they should have the same um, amount of well, there's one point one or there's one point eight billion, one point five billion in the construction. Billion. So they would get a share of that if they needed it. They they could ask for that. That's right. They're, and then they yeah. are um, they're a tier one school, but actually they're a lot higher in terms of their adequacy percentage than even we are. That's where we would rely on the Casarda study. It's one of those binders where they looked at in the next 10 years and they kind of have a, a very slow growth or no growth model uh, or in what they call a series um, series B, which is like moderate growth or a, like a high growth one. Um, it's, ex I, I have to just get, I don't have the exact number for you there. Um, maybe it's a little little more well, it's, it's about a growth of about 100 or so. Students, well, I, I can tell you this: they in right now um, our district's enrollment is twenty seven sixty six, and they predict us uh, in ten years using the Series B to grow one hundred and ten more students in the, in that time. Okay, so that's just a prediction. So, me, so you, you'd probably design or program it for a minimum of nine hundred, but you might consider programming the infrastructure elements like cafeterias, gymnasiums, 
and that sort of stuff to maybe a 1200 number. So, so, so then that being said, with a site or if we own a site, what does a 1200 per you know student capacity high school cost? Do you really want to know? Yes. <laughs> it's probably between 70 and 80 million, not counting the land. So one of the things that the board and some community members did um, last year is to go visit some schools in our area, some that had built new and some that had added on. And um, when John was talking about, you know, build it as if you could build on Richmond Burton High School, which um, Wold actually was a big part of, they have it like that, that they're able to kind of add on as the money comes and they can add on, you know, they can alter how the lunchroom looks and that becomes a different space and things like that. And one of the things that we want to hear from the community is like, we don't have an auditorium in our community. We, we have no place for our concerts. Uh, we have no place for our, we, we, we do theater productions and they're, they're doing a great job. But what if we had an acoustically sound place where we could actually, you know, do the things that our kids, how much more would they shine? And so we have a lot of those questions. Can we have an open fitness and rec center? It's a community center that we could share and you know after the, uh, the practices are all done at six o'clock uh, if you want to come in and walk the track or use the elliptical as a community member you could you know have your little nope. membership and come join us i mean so those are the things that we'll have to kind of do are there ways that will help the community feel like they can be a part of the school um, infrastructure the other thing to consider is that's just the high school that doesn't address if we moved a different grade level in here to address the locker room situation right. or the things going on at Jefferson, there's still expense past that to consider. It's I mean, not Crosby, just like, Crosby, that's, I mean, I don't know how much land we have over there, but that's pretty much a slab is over there, isn't it? What's that? A slab of concrete over there? That's just a slab on grade building. Yeah, so we could, I mean, that goes up pretty quickly. I mean, I mean an option. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a wood roof. You could blend that all day long. What, well, what not are, $70 million. One of the things that we talked about before, too, that I, working up here now, I can see how this might be workable is another elementary school move Jefferson, but then take that space and make a high school campus. It might end up being two buildings, maybe a field house and a main building, but take the area of Jefferson and then from here to 14, in that whole area, make a high school campus. Again, it might end up being two buildings, um, but Right, like I said, that you know, one building could be the freshman campus. Yeah. You have room for a field house or something. Yeah. In the next ten years, how many <coughs> students are we projected to get? You know, go up to like 100. One hundred. One hundred. One hundred. So, what age group is that going to be? Um, all scattered all, throughout. All scattered. The average, um, just to build one classroom on, <laughs> the average classroom is about four hundred thousand. If you're adding just a single classroom like that, just that's a ballpark like all. So every year, you know, this year, 30 more students, that's another classroom we should have had. Of course, they're, you know, distributed all throughout and dispersed, but that's a classroom. Recent construction costs, about 400000 That's 400000 We're kind of behind in our needs. So if you imagine you should add one of those every year, we we, we need to think about how we're going to do that. Yeah. Feel like, I think. From an educational standpoint, have you guys whiteboarded like, look, this is, we need a shop class, we need this, we need that. We don't have these things, right? We need, obviously, we need new locker rooms, we need an auditorium. I mean, it, you know, I mean, it, growth of 100 students, it's more of what this facility, this building doesn't provide for our students. That puts us at a disadvantage. I mean, it, it does, it simply doesn't. And, and it was built a hundred years ago. I mean, it's understandable. It wasn't built for the society that we live in now. It clearly wasn't, you know, where you need multiple locker rooms. I mean, there was no girls sports back then. There was only, you know, I mean, you know, I'm saying you need multiple locker rooms and, and there is no reason for those girls to be in those. That's, I'm embarrassed that my daughter was using those locker rooms. It's, it's insane. It really is. And I'm not mad at anyone. It, the, to, to be mad or point fingers is meaningless now. You gotta move forward. We talked about this earlier today. You know, you, you can't, we cannot keep kicking the can down the road. They've been doing that with the police station. Our police officers were working in, you know, they, whenever it rains, it floods in there. That's embarrassing to live in a community that does that. You, someone has to make decisions. It's not easy to do. People get upset. 
because you know we're taxpayers, it's, it's our money, I, I get it. But in the end, we have to do what's right for this community and, and the people that are our students that live, that go to school here and, and the people that live here. And, 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 and frankly, that's where we're gonna need your voices yeah. and that's why you're here tonight to see it for yourself because yeah. there will be a point in time where we're gonna come out with a plan and we need the public to understand they're not crying wolf, they really have these needs. Because one of the things that John is doing with our principals is they have to identify their educational needs and that's matched up to things that are inadequate. There, you know, what's the current status of that need? So the things that are rated a five, a high priority, but zero in terms of are where it, where it's at. Those are the things that probably will rise to the top of the list of things we're trying to address. And so. what kind of timeline are we looking at for all of this? Really, like well, the only thing that is real certain is that that on March first, we'll understand a little bit more about the application project for that uh, 1.5 billion state construction grant. So we have to kind of have a prioritization done and that's probably what I expect the board will be um, doing in January is after we've heard from old, we'll have to just kind of sit and plan, like what are we gonna do? How much money can we locally um, create? And is that sufficient for what we wanna do? And, and so in the meantime, because the locker room is, is really my biggest problem right now, what can we do? to help that? Well, anything we do would probably be like a summer thing. Um, so in terms of like now, now? Not now, no. no I'm, but, I'm thinking more for next school year because to me it it is so opposite for the boys and the girls. And especially now that I, I see those two locker rooms and with the gym, boys should not have both of those. So well, what can we do to fix that in the meantime? Uh, I'll, you know this already, but I'm going to remind you that um, five of our seven board members are um, mothers of women athletes. Um, our former board president was the, the gender equity title person in Woodstock when I was the, the principal there. That's not an issue that they're overlooking in any way. They are, these are mothers of athletes, and so that's not going to get overlooked. In the process. What is going to happen, I don't know, um, okay. because we have to figure out how to not spend half a million dollars on something that is gonna not work again two, two, two years later. So it has to be a part of a long range, what are we doing for three years, what are we doing five years, what are we doing 10 years? We wanna spend our money wisely, but we I, have to address it immediately too. I guess I view it at, you know, teachers all the time, or administration is constantly moving teachers in classroom, you know, moving things around. Why is that not happening with locker rooms saying, okay, this one's for the boys and this one's for the girls. Why is it not just being rearranged like that? Why does it have to be a money thing? I, I don't know. We, that's, we don't know. I don't know. I'm just okay. telling you that that's the way it's been. And until this point, we haven't really questioned it. Okay. And it will. I mean, that's that's why we're here tonight. Okay. If we were going to do nothing about it, we certainly wouldn't be here. <laughs> from the issue, we wouldn't be here tonight. We're going to talk about it. Okay. We have been talking about it for a year. Or so. What's your bonding capacity? Uh, not that great. It's not that great. I mean, we have to get through the Crosby bonds. Uh, we don't have to. We could, you know, do more, but we do have a limitation in that because of what we have on the books still with Crosby. And actually, our financial advisor kind of gave us some scenarios of kind of what, you know, how fast you could get aggressive with that, and you know, what's your if you wanted to do issue some new ones. You know, do you want to do 20, 25, 30 years? So there's a lot of scenarios and we're going to need their help and their advice in January when we talk about, you know, locally what we can do. We did have our person come. He uh, met with CFO uh, Mike Prom and I uh, three weeks ago and he talked about, you know, what is it you could locally handle within your own, within your own cash reserves with um, additional evidence-based money? How much is that locally that you can do without, you know, looking at any bond type thing? So that's what we need to do, and then figure out how can we add the the grant, the Illinois Construction Grant, and add to it, because then we wouldn't have to do anything with the um, with anything bonding at all. But that's probably not going to be enough to meet the whole needs that we have for the next ten years. That's it'll just be insufficient. So that's when we get to that point. But it's not great right now. There are a lot of neat things that are happening. I mean, the $50,000 that Steve won will kind of make that even better. Uh, the incubator room was all donations. There's not a single taxpayer dollar that went in there other than some um, 
you know, technology. But we really, those are the things we can do, and that's why we know we're enthusiastic about the future and the ideas. We just need to kind of rally the community to say, let's support this and, and build a better plant so we're not um, you know, looking at this again in 10 more years saying, wish we had done something. Uh, it'll be ready before March 1st okay. because when we send in our application, we want to be able to say, this is this is ready. And it might be just like the first step in, right. we don't know what steps two, three, four, and five are just yet, but we'll have certainly some things ready. But thinking about what are the priorities first and how would that sequence into a plan, that's that's probably the bigger discussion that the board will is, endeavor in in January. Is there a cap on them, the amount that a school is allowed? They haven't determined that yet. So it's possible that they will yeah. cap it? I would expect so, just so it's that cool. I mean, they're legislators, they all have their home district, they want to be able to say, we gave a little of my district, and so they're gonna spread it all out. They're politicians in the end, they wanna have something they can brag about when they go to the parade, the Milk Day Parade, or whatever. <laughs> they were or it, if there's a local share, there's kind of a built-in cap. That's, in, that's very in much what I respect. So. So I was telling Karen when uh, she was hosting, kind of getting ready, I said, the hard part of these meetings so far is they were just literally an invitation to come in and see, just so you could put your own eyes on and understand. Because when the board is kind of refining the plan and what we're going to do, we'll probably again have more meetings and say, okay, these are some of the things we're thinking about. Give us some direction on what you like, what, what should we include, what, what would you support, what don't you support, and so we can have more things. We need to hear from the students, too. We need to ask them. Uh, I'm going to shadow a student here um, at Harvard High School on Thursday. And uh, when we do our kind of debrief, we're going to do it in a podcast style. I'm going to ask her some questions. She's an athlete. And I'm going to ask her, what does it feel like when you have your locker room here and then you're on the volleyball team and you go to Richmond Burton and you go in their locker room? What does that, what does that feel like? Is that... I mean, I mean, that's kind of the things we need to talk about for our kids, the experience they're having. I mean, that's what moves me, actually, is just their experience. I want them to have that experience they deserve. So, gets me going. Gets me really going. I hope this hasn't felt like a downer, Dave. Um, still uh, meeting for you, but I think you get a sense of what the imperative is for us to really address this. And I think there's a lot of people with the courage to, to get creative with the issues and try and figure it out, but it's going to take us all to continue to be willing to be a part of the conversation and to be, I guess, morally a little angry about some of the things that, that we've, 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 we've had for a while. And as Jay said, it's nobody's fault, but we're the ones now in this place to fix it. And I think we're we're up to the task. I'd just say thank you to all for coming. Uh, one of the things we place a tremendously high value on is open and honest conversations and the willingness to engage in the difficult conversations, which some of these are, are really difficult issues. So, so uh, being an educator, I should probably give you some homework, right? Your homework would be tell your friends what you heard tonight, what you've seen, tell people, and. Uh, when those next rounds of meetings come up, they'll probably be, you know, after um, the start of the new year, invite them to come, bring some friends along so we can engage more people in the conversation so that we were really designing whatever it is we decide to do with everyone's input.